If you want to stay poor, that's fine. As for me, you know, we're going to the moon, baby. From the millennials perspective, Bitcoin is a way to retire financially. From the banker's perspective, Bitcoin is an attack on the existing global financial order. This kind of objective, nonpartisan, humanity agnostic information that flows every 10 minutes, that is so huge. Fiat will benefit by incorporating Bitcoin as indestructible digital collateral. If you're not comfortable with the price going down 50% and just still holding it, you shouldn't be buying it. The only way to have your money match up with a objective sound monetary policy is through merging your money and your economic power with Bitcoin. We're still very, very early in this thing. The best thing you can do is buy and hodl. You have $100,000. I mean, yeah, you can buy some stuff. It's great. But in comparison to the whole, it's still, you're like a little spec, basically. Now, take that and compare it to the Bitcoin ecosystem. You have the $100,000, you convert it to 1.4 Bitcoins. So you still have a very small percentage of the 21 million Bitcoins, but your slice of the pie is much larger. It's like 18 times larger. I'm so passionate about the things that I do. Um, it's very easy to, to kind of get off on a tangent and um, perhaps say things that I probably shouldn't be saying in front of the entire world on your podcast. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm a lawyer, I, you know, I can't, this is not legal advice. It's just, you know, my commentary on Bitcoin broadly. You know, the comments are my own. My statements are my own. They don't represent any organization or any employer. Is that, is that sometimes mm -hmm. uh, difficult? Like uh, have, having to be very careful <laughs> what you say? Like, I, I really like that. I just like speak what I, I think. I mean, I'm also getting more and more aware of uh, more and more people listening to me every day. And this is a huge yeah. influence and there's like some, some kind of responsibility there. But I always think mm -hmm. like, as long as you stay true to yourself, um, and say what you mean and don't like put anything out there, uh, then it's okay to rant it. Then it's okay to, to go through your passion and maybe you're wrong at that time. And maybe you, you learn something new later, but it's still like, it's the actual, like, I don't know with legal consequences, but it's the actual legal consequences. If you say something on a Bitcoin podcast and people are like, Oh, I, I acted on that. It's like, I, I don't know the law. So like, uh, I, I was never confronted with that topic. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you say something, uh, as an attorney, uh, that is, um, fraudulent or misleading or, um, hold yourself out to be something that you're not, um, like, let's say I, I go out there and, you know, I, I'm speaking about Bitcoin and finances and the central bank and, you know, the stocks and bonds. And, you know, I, I don't say and make it clear that I'm a, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not what I'm an expert in. But then I, at the same time, say something to the effect of, um, yeah, you should buy this. Or, you know, if you buy Bitcoin, the, the number is just going to go up, you know, uh, and it's going to go up forever. You know, uh, I, I think that somebody who took action on those comments, I think, could potentially file a complaint against me uh, with, you know, my state bar or try to come after me personally in some other way. So, I, you know, w when you have a license uh, to practice law, uh, you have to, you know, adhere to these professional rules and very similar to like being a doctor, you know, or being a nurse. Uh, you know, if, if you're a nurse, for example, you have a license, but you don't have a license to practice medicine. This is an area of special expertise. It's an area that has consequence uh, in the real world uh, to people uh, and to their welfare. Uh, and so you don't want to uh, hold yourself out to be something that you're not. And I think that is really at the core of, of why we say those things. Like, you know, this is not legal advice. These are just my personal statements. Um, now, I think you can go overboard with it, you know, and a lot of people do. You know, they'll say something to the effect of, you know, this is not uh, financial advice, you know, and they're just talking about how great silver is. And it's like, OK, like if you're dumb enough to like buy silver based on somebody saying how great silver or silver coin is, then you probably deserve to get dumped on. <laughs> Then, then, then let's make the, the disclaimer today. Uh, in this episode, there's nothing of financial advice and no legal advice. And right. I don't know, maybe it comes up. There's also no medical advice here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did talk about hair loss initially. 
Oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. True. That, that's not recorded, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was recorded, uh, the, the, but, but that, nothing like that. Um, yeah. That is actually one legal topic. Maybe we can get into Bitcoin if, if you can answer that, or if, if you are comfortable sharing that, uh, or if there is even an answer to that, because there is big people with big responsibilities, like Michael Saylor, who <laughs> publicly says very often. Bitcoin goes up forever. Like there's even this, like it goes up forever. Laura meme right. kind of like that. Um, and it's, it's fascinating how, 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 how this works and how people can say that about Bitcoin, but not about stocks. And it's, it's, it's like, there's like a whole, whole thing around that. Uh, one thing that was also explained to me by a lawyer once, he basically said, it's also, uh, makes a big difference, uh, the context of where you say it, if, if it's like on a, on a podcast where you just scream on the internet, or if it's like an, an intimate setting where you actually speak to individual people, this makes a lot of difference. Uh, and it can That's go. Yeah, uh, exactly. So like for the Bitcoiners out there and for the, maybe the, the influencers out there that talk about Bitcoin and a lot of people that uh, watch this podcast, I know, are posting on Twitter and this can also already be considered an influencer. What, what should we be aware yeah. of when we talk about Bitcoin? Is there anything that you're like, oh, like this could actually come back at us at, at, as Bitcoiners? Well, I, I, you know, the, it's an interesting question because I think it kind of blurs a line between free speech, at least in the United States, and uh, commentary, uh, or as some would say, uh, just, you know, I guess, uh, maybe advertising in some respects, uh, in some contexts, uh, and uh, informed uh, or legal advice or financial advice. Ordinarily, if we're giving advice, uh, that would be specific to your situation, uh, to your financial posture, uh, to your legal issues, uh, after some sort of uh, gathering of facts. Right. And so the concern is, is that some of the commentary, I think, and some of the posting and some of the uh, proclamations, for example, like Bitcoin's going to go up forever. Right. You don't know that. <laughs> right. And we don't know what the end result or consequence to those statements will be at this time. Right. So uh, there, there have been folks uh, in this industry, particularly, for example, with the ICOs. Uh, and um, with the exchanges that made statements and made promises, right? And they were prosecuted and some of them were put in jail, right? And so I think it's, it's really up to the speaker uh, in terms of, I think a good analysis is one, do you, do you have a license to say the things that you're saying, right? Uh, or specific to individuals, right? So if I said something to the effect of, um, you know, single families, you know, raising two kids, you really, you, you'd be really dumb not to buy, you know, two Bitcoins for each of your children uh, for their university education, right? So I personally, if I was a financial advisor or as a lawyer, I would never say something like that. Uh, and the reason why is because, you know, I hold a license, right? In parts, duties and responsibilities on me, to kind of to watch what I say out in the public domain. And um, that type of curated advice to like a family with two children uh, without knowing the larger context and details of what that family is going through uh, and what their uh, expenses are or what kind of university their child wants to go to, I think that would be an irresponsible statement by a financial advisor and also by a lawyer as well. Um, now if I'm just some guy, you know, um, I don't have a license, I don't have a business, right? No one's going to come after me. Uh, if I, if I say something like that, or the risk of somebody coming after me, if I say something like that is probably very low. Um, so it, it really is up to the speaker in terms of whether they want to have a conversation with their friend, which is different, as you mentioned earlier, the context or post something on Twitter where, with a global audience, right? Every person, if you have, if you're married and you have a child or two children, you'd be a fool not to buy Bitcoin today and hold one Bitcoin for that child's education. That That's just my risk adverse approach to statements. Um, when making statements online, particularly if you're a professional versus 
if you're just if you're just a person out there that's making statements. It's it's it it can be kind of weedy, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I, what I try to do is stay away from that. <laughs> I think that's that's probably yeah. uh, a good idea. Interesting enough is um, how many Bitcoin you should hold and uh, where the Bitcoin price is going are the two most clicked uh, video title thumbnails ever. Like if you put something like that together, I mean, there are other topics that are really popular, but those two are like really popular. If you put like numbers on, on the title and the thumbnail and you make a video around that. And that's why a lot of people actually also do it. And it's fu funny that those are like the, the, the kind of hard topics to discuss because you have to come with a lot of disclaimers with that. Uh, and especially interesting i find it always like when we talk about oh yeah the bitcoin price is going uh in that time frame to that price i'm like you have no clue if this actually happens like if you say just like in yeah. the line like oh bitcoin is going up forever then it's like okay yeah like first you can never prove that it's 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 wrong because you put such a long time horizon on that that yeah like maybe it's now down but it's going up forever so like after that it goes goes up again like it's, it's like really hard to to prove but if you go put like a time constraint on it like yeah 2025 in q4 bitcoin will go to 100,500 euros uh, yeah. and and that's why you should now buy one bitcoin like that's that, that would be an, a, a bad statement probably to make uh and if someone wants to go after you that you probably can especially if you have a license then you're more um i, I guess more attackable in, in in that sense but yeah that's that was not the quite not the topic that i wanted to get, get into with you but it i think it's really interesting and i never had it on the podcast so i was like let's let's go <laughs> go a little bit in there yeah no that's fine Absolutely, really cool. Uh, the first question that I actually wanted to ask you is, um, you had an interesting article where you described what Bitcoin is. And I, I love that a lot, a lot that you put the different perspectives in there. So like first for, for the people that don't know the article, what did you write in there? What is Bitcoin uh, for you? So yeah, the article, uh, I wrote, first, the timing of the article is really important. So I believe I wrote it in 2019. So I've been in the Bitcoin ecosystem since late 2017, uh, bought at the uh, all time high, right uh, at $19,000. Uh, and, but unlike most people, I'm not a trader per se, I'm much more of an investor. So I bought at the all time high in 20, uh, late 2017, right around Christmas. Uh, I believe it was 2017. Uh, and then 2018, I studied the hell out of Bitcoin. Uh, now, Rewinding to 2012, I think it was, I saw, I watched a couple of uh, uh, documentaries about Bitcoin while I was in law school. But the first inclination from the, the uh, documentaries from 2012 was that this thing is not going to work. Uh, it is um, too energy hungry. Um, it is not a currency. It's just, you know, weird, you know, experimentation of, of, of software. Uh, fast forward 2017, my buddy's making thousands of dollars based on Bitcoin. I'm not making that money. I'm investing in stocks, uh, bonds, things like that. But unlike some of the other traders who kind of sold out uh, uh, when the price started to dump, I continued to buy. So I was dollar cost averaging on the bottom. I bought the bottom at $3,000. Uh, I continued to do the research. Uh, and uh, Anthony Pompliano with the Pomp podcast was uh, one of the uh, podcasts that I watched religiously. And uh, one of, and also the What Bitcoin Did podcast uh, was was another, can't remember that guy's name right now, but you probably can. Peter McCormick, yeah. Yeah, Peter McCormick, yeah. So Peter McCormick with the What Bitcoin Did podcast was also, and I actually, uh, watched him religiously as well and the pop podcast he would ask people when they came on what is bitcoin and i thought it was fascinating because he had this kind of constant theme with every podcast and he asked people what is bitcoin and i noticed that the the answers started to diverge based on the perspective of the 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 holder right um and so that kind of got me to think about okay what is I'm going to write this article. Uh, it's going to be, what is Bitcoin? And what I'm going to do is try to make it a little bit kind of fun and, and artistic and 
and so that's what the article is. The article goes into what is Bitcoin from different perspectives. Uh, so, for example, I think I put in there from the millennials perspective, Bitcoin is a way uh, to retire financially. Uh, yeah, from the banker's perspective, Bitcoin is uh, an attack on the existing global uh, financial order. Uh, from the uh, coder's perspective, uh, Bitcoin is, you know, a a way to solve the the uh, the problem, the double spend problem, right? And so the 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 article goes into. I think I must have listed like twenty five articles uh, or twenty five viewpoints in there. I don't have the article in front of me, so I, I came unprepared, of course, uh, but. <clears throat> That's that's the gist of the article is uh, understanding that Bitcoin uh, in a, in a lot of ways depends on who you are and and its value I think depends on who you are as well. So we see this you know now with some of the holders uh, that are holding or hodlers I should say that are hodling uh, for retirement, and so I, I'm part of that uh, cohort. Uh, and then you see um, some others like the ETF managers, uh, uh, BlackRock and Larry Fink. I think they see the writing on the wall that this asset uh, or this technology, I should say, uh, is something that is definitely not going to be going away. And it's, it's growing. It's going to continue to permeate throughout societal, society. And so oh, here's the article right here. So. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> I, I love the last one. I love the last yeah. one. To the grandma, Bitcoin is a new form of money that my grandson told me to buy. Sure, why not? I trust him more than I trust bankers. <laughs> I, guess, so I guess he's a Bitcoiner. <laughs> All Bitcoiners trust uh, Bitcoiners yeah. more than bankers. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, and you know, the grandparents and the 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 elders in society, they're like myself. You know, I'm I'm over forty now, uh, not quite fifty, but I'm I'm. I'm getting to that point where I'm starting to look at really, you know, getting my um, like a squirrel with acorns, you know, just kind of holding on to them because, you know, life can happen at any time and you just never know when you're going to need that extra form of cash. Uh, but, you know, with the elders who are like, you know, in their 80s, first of all, folks are living a lot longer now than they ever have. Right. There, there's plenty of documentaries out there that go over. Uh, living longer and and just people are living longer, like in the nineties and hundreds. And, and we haven't even gotten to the point where AI is general or sentient. Uh, but I think it could possibly happen in our lifetimes uh, where AI has cured cancer, where AI has assisted humanity with gene editing, for example, or I think it's called CRISPR uh, where technology is, is at a point where it, it, allows people to live even longer than they ever have. Uh, and, you know, I think there are some folks out there who are really focusing on, you know, how to live a longer, you know, more fuller life uh, or fuller life rather. So that's really what the bottom one was, is to the grandma, Bitcoin is a new form of money that my grandson told me to, told me to buy. Uh, they've, lived, they've lived a life, man. I mean, these older, you know, I was raised by my grandparents. Uh, and so when I was younger in high school, and so a week did not go by to, that my grandfather or my grandmother wouldn't say out loud in the house, they're all crooks, you know, these people are crooks, you know, the, the, the bankers that is, uh, because they've seen the, you know, savings and loan crisis, you know, they've seen, you know, their stocks totally implode, um, you know, for my generation in 2000, and I believe it was 2008, I lived through the financial crisis, you know, and, you know, the central bank, you know, printed all this money out of thin air, you know, they gauged in what they call quantitative easing, and they just, you know, issued all these bonds that they bought themselves. I think the right hand was shaking the left hand, and they were just, there's just this circle, circular bond cash movement, and I guess it worked. Uh, I mean, we have inflation that is a problem now, uh, but, you know, I don't think you can print all that cash and have it just go to the top 1% and the ultra wealthy and, and 
you know, not have any ramifications as a consequence to that. I think what really ended up happening, though, uh, was the Bitcoin white paper that, you know, was issued right after the financial crisis, I believe in 2008 or 2009. I don't think they could have seen that. So I think that was kind of a, a black swan for them. And when I say them, I mean the the shareholders, uh, whether they be families or nation states or the, the, the people who primarily own and control central banking. Um, and there's, there's a lot of rumors as far as who owns what. Um, so I don't want to get into that. But what I do want to get into is I think now more than ever with the advent of the internet and the socialization of information, we're in a place where seeing behind a fraudulent veil of uh, security, a fraudulent veil of financial um, integrity uh, is, is very clear. I think people can see really clearly with their eyes, with the click of a mouse or just a little research, um, that there's shenanigans going on <laughs> with, with, with the banking system. Uh, and that, um, that it's not as open and free as we thought it was. Uh, that uh, so-called free markets, you know, that a lot of people died for in history, right? Um, that they're not as free as we thought they were. Um, that, that there's quite a bit of manipulation, uh, interest rate targeting. Uh, I, some of the podcasters that I listen to, I, I like when they say that it's a, a managed economy, that the economy is managed, the money is managed, right? It's not a free floating system per se. Um, there's the objective and then there's like trying to get to the objective. Like I think right now the objective is uh, trying to decrease inflation, right? Um, but what I also notice is that there's there's counterproductive interests. So there's more spending, right? So the Inflation Reduction Act, it's a great example. We'll pass a bill, we'll spend you know a trillion dollars and we'll call it the Inflation Reduction Act. So I, I think that's really fascinating because you know people there genuinely people still believe that that will that that bill is intended to reduce inflation. Maybe it was, maybe it does. I, I personally, you know, as an over 40 year old, I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that that passing a bill like that would reduce inflation. Um, anyway, sorry. I, that, that, I'm going to end my rant right there. <laughs> it, I, I, I love it so much because it's, it's, uh, it's like, like spending money, like creating money out of thin air is the very reason why we have inflation. And they try to, with more spending, uh, counteract uh, in, in inflation. That, like, it, it's, it's like you hit your toe and your toe hurts because of that. And in order to not uh, be hurt on the toe, you hit your toe even more like like that, that doesn't make any sense there's not a better comparison to that it's it's, it's great and and people actually yeah, sure. are like yeah yeah we should we should spend a lot of money to uh fight against inflation like inflation is some sort of like a uh, terrorist attack which which like comes to our country and then we have to fight them with like uh armor or something like that like it does not work like that it, yeah. it, it's so funny how, how, how people's brain work if they don't understand how money actually works there's a lot of people i think if you go out there uh and ask people randomly if the inflation reduction act actually will impact inflation uh, in a positive way most people probably will say yes uh, it's it's, it's a, sad, a sad state that we are currently in i feel like yeah you know and i i think i think the so people see it on a day-to-day -day basis so the the cpi this the consumer price index right which from what i understand i'm, I'm certainly no expert but from what i understand the the actual end result of the CPI is this number that doesn't actually serve a good purpose, right? Because it's missing a lot of really important metrics. It's missing the cost of food. It's missing the cost of energy. It's missing the cost of housing. It's missing the cost of the, the, um, the uh, cost of, of, of holding a, a bill, for example, like let's say you have student loans or let's say you have credit card debt, right? The, the CPI is not going to reflect those real tangible costs uh, that the consumer has to bear. I think childcare, 
Like if you, from what I hear, I don't have children, but from what I hear in the United States, if you have a child, I mean, it's like $500 a week sometimes to have childcare while you go to work. I mean, that that's just insane. I mean, does the CPI include that? And if it doesn't, should it, right? That we, we need to have a better metric in terms of how, how government extracts data that is valuable to markets. I think that that's a very, very big statement. I don't want to get too deep into it, but that that's my sense, right? And again, I'm not an economist, uh, but my sense is that the data is just bad data in, bad data out is what we're living through right now. So kind of looping it back to Bitcoin is one of the things that I really like about Bitcoin and uh, among many other things is that it's absolute true data. Right. So you have the 21 million cap. Right. You have money coming in. You have money coming out. You have the Satoshis. Right. You have a constant 21 million dollar or excuse me, 21 million Bitcoin cap. Uh, And then you have the Satoshis that are incorporated in a single Bitcoin. I mean, and then you have the blockchain, the open public ledger that you can go and see for yourself uh, that is verified about every 10 minutes. Right. um, By the miners. And so this kind of objective, nonpartisan, um, humanity agnostic information that flows every 10 minutes, uh, you know, TikTok next block, uh, that's huge. That is so huge because it's, it's, a, it's a measuring stick that we can measure how much our money is really worth, right? And so that's why, that's why I believe Partly why, not fully why, but I think that's partly why the number continues to go up. Yeah. For me, uh, Bitcoin, like inflation rate is what you buy. And for me, Bitcoin is the inflation rate. Like I, 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 I with most of my money that comes in, I buy Bitcoin. Uh, and so Bitcoin is kind of the inflation rate. That's why I also think it's stupid to measure an all-time high and adjust it to inflation. Like a lot of people say like, no, we did not hit an all-time high in 2024 in, in April there because you have to adjust it for inflation. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, Why do we have to adjust our right. Bitcoin price to inflation? That does not make any sense for right. me because I see Bitcoin as the hurdle rate, as the inflation rate kind of, uh, because uh, with a lot of money, I, I buy uh, Bitcoin uh, on a regular basis. But I like one thing that you said earlier, and I really want to highlight that. Uh, you saw Bitcoin, specifically the Bitcoin white paper, as the black swan event for central banks i I love that so so much because they couldn't see that coming and the the very thing that was um like without bitcoin they can just do their thing till the end of time basically because they can always reinvent currencies they can reinstate trust but with bitcoin we have kind of this fire alarm for the fiat currency which is like oh yeah like if bitcoin goes to a million or goes to two million this shows like how bad the fiat system actually uh, looks like. I, I love the, the, this, this, uh, different viewpoint. I never heard that Bitcoin is the black swan uh, event, event for central banks. So I just wanted to, to, to highlight that because uh, I think it's a great perspective to look at Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, and I, I think it kind of boils down to, to disruption, technological disruption. Uh, and for folks who are as old as me, over 40, I mean, we remember when, when we were children, we'd go to Blockbuster to rent a movie, right? Blockbuster video. I don't know if they have it in where you're at, but, uh, you know, you walk in, you get a big black VHS tape, you know, and then you rent it for two days and then you bring it back and you drive back and forth. And it was like a family trip. You know, they, they had candy and, you know, popcorn and then Netflix came out. Right. And so it was like, okay, what is this Netflix thing? And then it had like the CDs. So you had like DVD CDs that would come out uh, and, you know, they were mail. So it was great. We didn't have to like, we could just cook dinner at home and we didn't have to like go to Blockbuster. You just, you know, have a Netflix video in your queue and, you know, it would be there when you, when you got home from work. And this is awesome. Right. And then they got rid of the CDs and now we just have streaming, Netflix streaming, right? And you can, from what I, uh, I think also there are some other streaming services where you can buy the movie that is out, you know, in theaters right now, right? So 
the there's this there's this condensation of technology and information flow that we are still very we as society and humanity i believe we're still very much going through right now and it's and once you start to see these trends it's easier to kind of see the next trend so i put on my uh bitcoin in 30 minutes uh youtube uh channel that i've created i think i have like three or four videos up there but the intent with those videos was to condense the Bitcoin down into 30 minutes so that folks could kind of take bite-sized pieces of it, uh, mostly because, you know, a lot of people have like attention spans of gnats, but also because it's it's kind of a complex topic. And these, these complex topics, uh, you know, you want to try to condense them down to 30 minutes, right? Maybe even less if you can. But I have one of them in there. It's called, you know, why Bitcoin won't just go away. And I compare Bitcoin to uh, the invention of railroad tracks, this idea that you have two steel beams that are going along, you know, this 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 higher elevation. And you have these these steel wheels that, you know, are along these two parallel steel beams. Right. With some sort of like uh, power, uh, steam generated power or some other maybe electrical generated power. I think there are some electrical trains now, of course. Um, but the idea is that the invention itself, right, the, the railroad tracks, it, it, is, it is there to serve a useful purpose, right? So the utility, people often say, Bitcoin is, is useless. You can't use it for anything, right? I think the accurate statement is Bitcoin largely, and this is going to be in my next video that I come out with, largely cannot be, is largely is not used for goods and services in the real economy. And, you know, people like a lot of Bitcoiners look at, oh, I can't believe you said that. But it's true. Like you, we use cash, we use, you know, Venmo or things like that, mostly in the United States, primarily because there's a tax implication if you use Bitcoin to purchase goods and services. Uh, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is when it comes to Bitcoin, right, its utility is the railroad tracks. And I don't think that central banks kind of looping it all the way back to what we mentioned earlier. I don't think that central banks could have seen that their uh, the, the financial system and the entire monetary policy that comes with our existing financial system has totally been disrupted by Bitcoin, by technology, by open source software that says, no, the monetary policy is not going to be infinite debt and infinite cash, right? Which is the current monetary policy, infinite debt, infinite cash. I mean, the, the central banks have, the bankers have, have got up there and, and said it explicitly. And also, you know, the monetary policy is not going to be, hey, we're going to give you a special deal off out, out of this window if you're a big bank and you're too big to fail. And, you know, no, we're not doing that. Like the monetary policy is going to be this objective sound money that is 21 million cap that a lot of people already have it. Right. Like you have some. I have some. Michael Saylor has probably a lot, you know, and. That's just an option. It's going to be, I, I disagree with some people that say, okay, Bitcoin's going to replace fiat, right? I think that what's going to end up happening in the medium term is that we will have an environment where Bitcoin has a parallel ecosystem to fiat. Like the two will exist together. Uh, and I think at some point the two will have or formulate kind of like a symbiotic relationship with each other like fiat will benefit by incorporating bitcoin as indestructible digital collateral and bitcoin will benefit by by being able to be transact transacted in a synthetic fiat token so for example like a us dollar coin or whatever i mean is that a cbdc yeah i don't know i mean maybe yes maybe no but i guess the point i'm trying to make is from the from the perspective of the black swan um, that Bitcoin was for central banking, I think eventually it was going to happen, right? That engineers, software developers, uh, thinkers, tinkerers would get fed up with their uh, their savings, uh, their economic purchasing power uh, being diluted and being stolen through taxation or through inflation. And that there would be a techno technology solution, if not just a technology partial solution, right, uh, which I think is Bitcoin.
I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. Mm. I, I, I love that a lot with the digital railroad uh, and, and, and uh, also how like uh, Bitcoin is interacting, especially in the medium term with uh, the fiat system because you still have volatility in purchasing power of Bitcoin, uh, which makes it hard to take as your unit of account for businesses. Uh, for example, I accept payments uh, with my spa partners in Bitcoin. Most of them pay in Bitcoin, but we still set the price in uh, euros or dollars because yeah. uh, that would just be like very... <laughs> Like you said it at one point and then it like goes down and up. Like, I mean, kind of the same thing if we pay in there, but we set the price still in, in US dollars. So volatility is still a thing that will go away at some point, but right now it's a reality. Then taxes uh, is also still a reality. Uh, that's just a legal thing. And the other thing is also, it's not widely accepted by everyone. Like we have to do a lot of education still, but I think Bitcoin is perfect money but we have a long way that everyone also agrees and sees it and implements it in that way. And I think in the medium term, actually, we will have, we already have a hybrid between fiat and, and, and Bitcoin because people already use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange unit of account. Uh, not a lot, but some do. And uh, most of them do fiat. So like we already have the hybrid, but this like 99% fiat and 1% Bitcoin will probably uh, come to a more balanced view at, and then some point will will jump over. I don't know if if Bitcoin ever will completely ero erode fiat, I've, I've like, I, I struggle with that question so, uh, so much. And I ask a lot of people on, on the show, uh, and there are so many different answers coming. So I have no clue, uh, on, on that regard. But I like also how you, uh, say Bitcoin, uh, digital railroads. How do you think Bitcoin will change how we, how we move things? Um, the things are like money with assets and, and in general, how, how, how will Bitcoin Im impact that? Well, I think it's already happening. I think that the, the truckers in Canada was a great example about how the, the, the state, the nation state could, for better or worse, like ethically or not ethically, ostracize and cancel uh, groups that it disagrees with. Uh, I think that's, that's, uh, I, maybe not disagrees with it, de it. It depends on how you frame it, right? So if you have a a 
terrorist group, for example, right? Well, the state disagrees with that terrorist group, right? So it, I think most people would disagree with the terrorist group. And uh, But if you just have a protest, right, which from what I understand, the truckers are up there protesting in Canada. This is like a couple of years ago, I think. And and then you had the bankers, you know, just basically cut them off. Like, you know, you're not going you know, to have access to your accounts to go up there and do the things that you want to do. Uh, people moved Bitcoin to them. So they, they, they got monetary value uh, moved at the speed of light from donors uh, or others who wanted to do business with them, um, whether through their own personal economic reasons or through some other uh, political reason that they wanted to support their cause. Uh, so I think that's happening. That's already happened. Uh, I think that uh, the movement of Bitcoin, so for example, of in, in El Salvador, from what I understand, uh, some of uh, the nation state down there uh, is buying and holding Bitcoin as part of their sovereign reserve, right? And so this idea that you're going to, as a collective, as a nation state collective, right, that this, that people are speaking with one voice through the nation state collective, right, and buying and holding Bitcoin, I think is, is groundbreaking. Uh, I don't think we've ever had that. Maybe with gold, right? But the difference, and I've mentioned this in one of my Bitcoin in 30 minute videos as well, is the difference with gold and Bitcoin is you can't move it unrestricted for point A to point B um, throughout the world, right? And have it be, have, have very little to no intermediary that, that takes, you know, two or five, 10% off the top, whether it's Visa, a bank, or whether it's, you know, Western Union or some other third party fiat, uh, you know, that moves money from, you know, different countries. Uh, rather, the movement of money is exclusively digital. It's exclusively free. It's exclusively open. And I think that that, that, is, that is catching on. I think it will continue to catch on. Um, so uh, I think one of the, the, um, one of the things that I'm quite surprised of is that, that it hasn't caught on quicker, I think. Um, I think um, back in 2018, 2019, I was, I was totally convinced that by 2023, 2024, Apple would be accepting Bitcoin or Satoshis for their products, right? And that just has not happened. So there is a little bit of a concern that I have about that. Um, but I think, I think the reason why that has not happened is partly because of what you mentioned previously, which is the volatility of Bitcoin, which is still very volatile. Uh, it can go... You know, when folks ask me if they should buy Bitcoin, like one on one, like non-legal capacity, non-financial advice, the first thing I tell them is if you're not comfortable with the price going down 50 percent and just still holding it, you shouldn't be buying it. This is what I told them in 2018, 2019, 2020. I, I kept telling them, you know, because I, people would ask me, should I buy Bitcoin at 69,000? And I would just pay hey, if you're not if you're not comfortable with holding it, you know, at thirty thousand and twenty thousand when it drops, then maybe you should go buy a bond or something like that. You know what I mean? Because the bond is it's not going to drop, you know, on its face value, right? It may drop in terms of its real value in the real economy, but it's it's not its face value is going to stay the same. It's going to make you feel better when you go to sleep at night. So, but for Bitcoiners, uh, I think most Bitcoiners. Uh, including myself, you know, I always buy with the intention that this thing could drop by 50% or 30% tomorrow. And there's not a damn thing I can do about it. I mean, I suppose I can take my hardware wallet, go to Coinbase or go to Kraken or some other, you know, third party uh, exchange and sell it really quick. Right. Uh, but no, I, I'm not going to do that because these Bitcoins, I have a plan for them. But I guess to answer your question very succinctly, I think it's happening. I think it's going to continue to happen. Uh, I think in terms of moving Bitcoin from point A to point B and holding Bitcoin for its economic properties and its objective sound money principles, as well as its monetary policy that is unmanipulatable, is that a word, that cannot be manipulated, is, is growing. So I think it was Mich Mich Michigan or Wisconsin their retirement fund is holding it. I think the Japanese even are starting to hold it. Uh, I think there's been some Calif uh, some Texas firefighters 
uh, uh, pension funds that are holding it. So the word is, you know, those um, entities, whether they be people, companies, pension funds, nation states, nonprofits, uh, whether they be endowment funds, whether they be, you know, so, uh, family funds, I, I think those entities that are looking for those sound money principles that are superior to gold and, and also superior to real estate in a lot of ways, and they have the extra cash and they're okay with seeing it drop by 50% and just holding it, those people are coming into Bitcoin because they're, they're looking for the return, they're looking for the duration, and they're looking for... In my opinion, this is all my opinion, not financial advice, not legal advice. Uh, just I think they're looking for the continuity that Bitcoin has for the future, right? They're looking towards the future, right? If, if the economic fiat base collapses and there's just, let's just print another 30 trillion, right? What's, what's another 30 trillion between friends, right? Then they're like, okay, that's going to just explode inflation. Oh, and... That doesn't even get into, we're just going to give money away. You know, I haven't even touched on the principle of UBI, uh, universal basic income, this idea that potentially AI could get, and Elon Musk has talked about this, and I agree with him, that um, AI could get so powerful and so useful that and productive that it could literally cause a mass unemployment crisis, Right. So what does the state do when there's an ad, when there's a crisis? Print, print, baby, print, right? And tax, um, tax to fund the printing. Um, so I think that we could very well see a, a scenario in the future where UBI is is a thing, right? We, we have millions of people on uh, welfare today, uh, or what they call um, uh, SNAP. Uh, I think it's substance nutritional something program. It's basically like food food credit where you can get like, you know, food for families who can't make ends meet. But I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to see more handouts, more giveaways, and more printing. Uh, and so the only way, I think, to uh, have your money match up with a objective sound monetary policy is through merging your money and your economic power with Bitcoin. Because that 21 million cap and the blockchain doesn't lie. It just is what it is. It's like railroad tracks. You know, it it just is what it is. You know, it was invented. We're here. It's useful. You can build a steam rail on it. You can build a locomotive on it. You can transport things on it and to the future, right? Um, you can build a high-speed rail on it. I think eventually we will have high-speed rails. I think we'll have fourth generation blockchains that, that speak to the Bitcoin network. Um, so I, I think the possibilities are still very, very open. And I, I still, and I think we're still very, very early in this thing. I do. I, I do do agree 100%. It's, it's funny how the uh, perspective uh, <laughs> are, are different because I'm actually surprised by how far we are already with the medium of exchange side of things because I, I was like, okay, we are now in the store of value adoption phase and I'm completely surprised that there's like in Nigeria and El Salvador, even like I uh, spend Bitcoin now on a monthly basis uh, on, on like a meetup or like for, for example, El Salvador, they're adopting Bitcoin content conference that is when this podcast will come out already over probably um uh will i will i spend their bitcoin for the tickets and stuff like that so it's i'm kind of surprised that we already have so much circular economy so much um medium of exchange because right now bitcoin the best thing you can do is buy and hodl and and, and and don't <laughs> like that's the use case f for me personally right now and not uh, like oh i want to spend it and and stuff like that so that that's that's uh does not make sense for me right now because there are tax implica implications stuff like that for in there but on that topic um what do you think are the, the biggest um hurdles or the biggest challenges that that will come our way for for bitcoin adoption in in the future well i think i think uh for individuals so i'll start with individuals because i think the the hurdles depend on who you are so if you're a company or if you're a hedge fund or if you have if you're acting in the market you know uh you know you need to have it 
you know, certified and authenticated and, you know, have it be, you know, part of the special club of, you know, assets that you're allowed to buy, I guess. But when it comes to individuals, so going back to individuals, I think the biggest, in my personal opinion, the biggest problem is the tax. The, this idea that when I spend Bitcoin, um, I'm doing so with a capital gain, or excuse me, a taxable event, right? So if I go buy a $2,000 US dollar um, LED flat screen, right, which is what I'm in the market for right now, um, that is a taxable event. I have to calculate the basis of where I bought Bitcoin way back in 2018, right, when I bought it like 3500 bucks or whatever, and then spend the taxable, excuse me, the capital gains tax, which is like, I don't know, is like, I think it's, I, I, I don't even know what it is. What is it, like 21% or something like that? Um, I, it, yeah. it depends, I think, like, in, it's it's also like that. Yeah. In, I, I, I think in America, there's like a difference between long-term and, and short-term. I think short-term is yeah. like maybe yeah. 10%, but I have no clue because I'm not in America. In, in Austria, it's 27, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> but definitely yeah, there's like taxes. 80%. Yeah, so it, this would be a this would be a long-term capital gains and gains from sale of assets long-term is zero to 20%, depending on your taxable income. So, I mean, that that's quite a bit of tax. And that... I mean, obviously, if you're talking about a 300x technology, where I already uh, you've gained 300, you know, percent out of the technology, then you reduce 20 percent, so now it's like 280 percent. Um, you know, it's not, it's still not bad gain, but who wants to pay that, right? So, I think the tax is 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 a barrier. It's a significant barrier, I think, um, because you know it, it makes no difference whether you buy a two thousand dollar TV versus a Ten dollar, you know, McDonald's meal. It's it's calculated the same, right? There, there's no there's no tax exemption for for these transactions, which is hugely problematic. I think um, I think it's problematic primarily, you know, primarily because it doesn't allow Bitcoin to move in the real economy the way I think it should, um, and it, it causes the the volume of Bitcoin transactions to go down substantially. Um, but that said, you know, there was a time where the Bitcoin uh, mempool uh, or the blockchain before it gets to the blockchain was so crowded, right? And uh, there was just too many transactions that the memory pool couldn't keep up with. And so uh, the transaction fees were like, you know, $15 for a transaction or whatever. It was like crazy. This is like 2018, 2019. Um, and so I think there's a problem there too, but that's much more of a technology problem than it is a tax problem. So I think the taxes is, is partly the problem. Um, I think the, um, let's see, in terms of adoption, uh, I think education is, is an issue as well. Um, and I think education is really interesting because you can get at education at any level, basically. Um, so last year I went to a Lego festival in Virginia and um, there was there was a little spot where you can put Legos up and make like a little like um, mosaic of some sort, but with Legos. Right. And so my mosaic, of course, was a Bitcoin symbol. Right. So I, I made this big Bitcoin symbol and this little boy comes up next to me and he was like he had to be like nine years old or eight years old. He was a little kid, like probably elementary or middle school. And he comes up to me, and goes, oh, look, Bitcoin. And I was like, what? And I looked at him and I was like, you know what Bitcoin is? And he's like, yeah, that's a Bitcoin. That's a Bitcoin. And I'm like, well, what is Bitcoin? He's like, it's like digital money. And I'm like, holy shoots. We, you know, we have reached altitude with this technology in terms of at least, if not know, knowing the understanding, the, the monetary policy and why it's important for humanity, but at least knowing what the symbol is, right? The branding and the symbolism, I think, is so important because it at least gets the conversation started, right? So another example of, of how Bitcoin is continues to proliferate is there was a, um, there was a Halloween uh, uh, ring camera that captured some, some kids here in America going up to the, uh, to the uh, little candy bucket. And there were these little Bitcoin 
uh, cards, right? And they're like, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Like, you know, you got to get one, you got to get one, or you got to get some, you know? And so the, the idea in terms of its value or its desirability, I think, is, is definitely there. And there were some kids in the background, they're like, what's a Bitcoin? What's a Bitcoin? You know, like, so I think there, there's an understanding at a very young level that, and from what I understand also that they're learning about, you know, my, my middle school nephew told me like last month that they're learning about Bitcoin and economics in, in middle school, right? And so I think the notion of digital money that, that starts from birth, right? It, it is never nation state money. It's totally agnostic, right? It's literally pure digital money and an objective, you know, railroad track, whatever you want to call it, blockchain, right? It, that invention is so important that it's being taught in schools. So I think the the education is certainly there and the continuity as far as the understanding and the acknowledgement that we need this thing uh, to, to it, at, at very least balance out, you know, what we, the society that we live in today. I think, I think Bitcoin is, serves as a balancing mechanism, but anyway, so we got the taxation, we've got the, um, the education. Uh, let's see what else I think. I think I wrote these down eventually somewhere, but I can't find them. Uh, let's see. Volatility. Uh, I don't think so. I think those two, I think those two is what I got for that. As far as adoption, those are the big hurdles that I can think of right now. Because pension yeah, funds it's... are our, pension funds are already in it, you know. Nation states are starting to buy it, right? So we are we are on a path of adoption. I think the floodgates are open. Uh, they're still closed in some respects, uh, but 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 they are open. Uh, in 2018, we talked about the ETF floodgates were, you know, they were just starting to crack open, you know. But we didn't have a U.S. ETF. I think Australia had an ETF. Canada had an ETF. You know, but uh, the United States, the capital market, you know, the, the largest one didn't have an ETF. And then we had some 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 bans going on with the China ban. And it was like, you know, OK, you know, this is not good for adoption. But then it failed. And then China got back on board with the Bitcoins. I'm like, OK, that's good for adoption. Right. So there are some barriers still. And I think there they, some of them are legal barriers when it comes to taxation. And some of them are education barriers when it comes to learning uh, why Bitcoin is important and, and why why it why it continues to be number go up technology. I, like I said, I, I can't guarantee the number go up, but I think it is number go up technology. Will it always be that way? I don't know. I mean, I, I think if if countries are able to engage in some sort of austerity, uh, you know, buckling up the spending, maybe some audits uh, that would uh, decrease or make more efficient the, the, the power of each dollar or the, the power of each unit of currency, of political currency. I think that would be helpful uh, to kind of temper down the, the, the Bitcoin growth. So the two are kind of, you know, as money just gets out of control, the Bitcoin growth also just gets out of control too so it, it's very much a barometer in that way um but you know and, and we saw that with the central banks and when the central banks you know increased the interest rates um i think they they got up to like what seven percent eight percent something like that uh that that decreased i think i think in my opinion that 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 operated to decrease the the fast increase of price for bitcoin um but when the when the central bank uh, decreased the um, the percentage rates, I think it was like half a percent that caused the Bitcoin price again to just go back up. You know, so it's there's definitely some responding that's going on there. there there's some symbiosis, I think, that is going on there. Uh, the, the relationship between the interest rates and Bitcoin. I think if interest rates came down all the way to two percent and and cheapened the value of the currency, Bitcoin would be way above a hundred a hundred thousand right now. I do. It's interesting uh, when we look at the <coughs> perspective of Bitcoin as a number go up technology. Uh, for me, I think last year I discovered that that's a site that I share now priced in, in Bitcoin21.com. Um, I have still no clue where, who, who even made that site. I think it's it's, it's an amazing one. Um, but uh, it's it's like when you look at 
everything in the world and then you price it in Bitcoin, then you actually get to know like what Bitcoin actually is. Like Bitcoin for me is like not like, of course, it's number of technology because right now the unit of account is US dollars or your local fiat currency. Also for me, I think in euros, obviously, but if you make that mind shift already now and think in Bitcoin, it's really powerful. <laughs> and, and right now it's uh, massive to see like everything is red in terms of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is reaching up uh, so high, but even like an, an S&P 500, when you see the the, um, the equity markets uh, it's like there's like one green thing in here energy if you look at the three-year chart <laughs> so like it's it's everything is red in, in in bitcoin terms oh there's another green one uh, but also just in like the month uh, column so yeah. i think that's that that shows the the power that bitcoin had over the last couple of weeks months years and soon decades because we are already one and a half decades in, in into this uh, Bitcoin thing. And I do think as long as Bitcoin uh, works in the future also as sound money and, and all other assets are getting debased all the time that this pattern will just uh, continue to happen. Uh, but uh, I, the, the mind shift is really important. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think partly why we see that is because Bitcoin is still very new. Uh, it's still relatively a new asset on the world stage. I remember in 2018, 2019, where um, some of my friends uh, and some family members too would say, hey, Bitcoin's a bubble. This thing's a bubble. It's going to pop, right? And, you know, really kind of got me thinking, you know, because I grew up in, you know, I was, I was mentored by my uncle who owned some, he did real estate development uh, and, you know, for low cost housing. So he would always watch the bond prices, right? Yeah, 2% or 3% or whatever. And he was around when 2008 came down and, you know, all the banks were bailed out. And, you know, his, his company was really hurting at that time. But uh, I bring that up because he would always talk about like really big numbers, you know, like 14 million, you know, and, you know, there's so much trillions here and trillions there. And, and you know it was hard to keep up with these these big numbers and i get i mentioned that because in 2018 2019 i did not think that bitcoin was a bubble at all i thought it was a retail bubble right like retail which you know if you if you consider how much cash retail has in their accounts right middle class lower middle class upper class americans maybe even a little bit of the 1% sprinkled in I mean, it can't be more than, you know, I don't know, like a trillion maybe, right? But that that's in comparison to how much cash and how much debt exists, right? So every bond that's out there, uh, from the way I understand bonds, you can convert them into cash. At some point, there's a maturity date and then you get paid, right? So uh, plus the interest. So at least that's how I think it works. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not a financial guy, but um, I mentioned that because the the whole idea of a bubble right when it came to bitcoin was not there it just was not my thought was okay this thing's approaching 900 trillion it's still a baby like it, it's so young it's so tiny so what we're seeing i think today is that bitcoin is starting to and i think uh, some other commentators have already commented on this it's starting to price people out like, you know, middle class Americans are being priced out. The millionaire class is going to be priced out. The billionaire class is eventually going to be priced out. And then the entities with, with trillions of, of cash, right, they'll also be priced out. And at that point, Bitcoin will be our, you know, monetary system, I guess. Um, I mentioned that because, you know, the chart that you pulled up with respect to having everything, uh, up, not everything, but like, most of the larger assets and, and, and markets, the S&P, the NASDAQ and gold and oil and things like that, the numbers are in the red as compared to Bitcoin. And I think the reason why they're red in comparison to Bitcoin is because Bitcoin's still very much growing. It's still got a long way to grow. Uh, you know, I did this exercise recently and it's it's thinking about, OK, if I can go to Coinbase, right, if I can go to Coinbase and buy uh, let's see, $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, right? So that gives me, to, at today's market price, I did some math, that gives me about 
I think it's like 1.4 Bitcoins or something like that, right? With $100,000. The point of the exercise is to compare the two, uh, the two ecosystems. You have the US dollar ecosystem, which has 37.3 something trillion in cash, uh, liquidity, and bonds, right? And then if you have $100,000 of 37 point whatever, three, five trillion dollars, right? That's like 0.00000% of the entire ecosystem. Your share of that entire cash dominated ecosystem or fiat dominated ecosystem is super, 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 super tiny, right? It's, it's like really tiny, right? In other words, you're not rich. Like you're, you're, you have a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, yeah, you can buy some stuff. It's great. But in comparison to the whole, it's still, you're like a little speck basically. Now take that and compare it to the Bitcoin ecosystem, right? You have a hundred thousand dollars. You convert it to 1.4 Bitcoins, right? So you still have a very small percentage of the 21 million Bitcoins, but your slice of the pie is much larger. It's like 18 times larger, 18 or 19 times larger of the entire pie. The idea is that, would you rather live in a future where your slice of the pie is like a little speck versus your slice of the pie is actually, you know, a nice little meal? Does that make sense? So the, the, the idea of the exercise is to Try to understand that Bitcoin is not, it's not necessarily competing with the dollar, right? I know it seems like that right now, but I think Bitcoin is its own ecosystem that eventually I think will play together with the US dollar. Like you'll go to the store and this is just my speculation again, you'll go to the store and I think in some countries it's already happening, as you mentioned, and you will be able to buy things in Bitcoin without being taxed to death. For doing so, uh, that doesn't mean that the fiat will go away because I think I think it won't go away. I think it will still be its own thing, right? But it will mean that the the value of the cash, right, will be much more debased in that future than, and you will have much less of the pie. And again, that's a hundred thousand dollars, right? That's that's for a lot of people, that's that's a whole year of of work, right? But if you by if you just hold the cash, right? And this is partly what Micro Seller is doing. You know, you're losing, you're losing, you're losing, you're losing. You're, you're getting less of the pie, less and less, less of the pie every day. If you convert the cash instantaneously to Bitcoin, you get a much bigger piece of the pie, right? And you're not being debased every single day. So the two ecosystems are very different. I think it makes common sense, like which one you want, right? You want the bigger piece of the pie. Um, and plus, it's just more exciting. So that that's that's an amazing uh, perspective, and I think it also shines a light on like the two differences. Like, um, like when we look at why Bitcoin is growing your purchasing power, there are really two reasons for that. And I'm not talking about growing the US dollar price. I'm actually talking about growing your purchasing power. If like Bitcoin goes up in a year, two percent. You probably lost purchasing power uh, in, in in that year because your pri prices, what you have to pay for keeping your, yourself alive, is is higher, is rising more than two percent most likely. Uh, so, like, there's two reasons why the purchasing power of Bitcoin is is going up. The first reason is like we get more efficient. Like, uh, we 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 make uh, things cheaper. We we make things more efficient in a way. Uh, and and the second reason why Bitcoin purchasing power is growing is more people coming into Bitcoin, and that's yeah, the great. main reason right now why we have those crazy crazy um, bull runs and bear runs and and all those cycles where we see forty percent down and three hundred percent up and and those things because we have. An asset that's which is really compelling and a lot of people flow into this asset and when a lot of people come in that asset obviously volatility is a result of that once uh bitcoin reaches reaches a maturity and then there's a whole nother debate what, what does that mean <laughs> what does it mean bitcoin maturity but let's just leave it at that right now then 
we don't have a lot more people coming in. Maybe we have more people come in if we find other planets with other people on there or something like that. Uh, but that's a whole nother discussion. But we, we have a closed system then. And then the only way Bitcoin purchasing power is growing is if we get more efficient. So Bitcoin purchasing power maybe is going up 1% or 5% in a year, and it's not a lot. Uh, and, and this is like the, uh, the way I like to think about it. And then when you also then put on the US dollar price, obviously it, it goes up way quicker than that because the US dollar is losing purchasing power. So I think what you just described is an amazing, also my shift that you have to do and like why is bitcoin actually growing in purchasing power what are the reasons behind it i love that a lot yeah yeah i mean, I mean the, the, there, there are promises that have to be made right so when, when we're talking about nation states just generally right even even companies right when you issue a bond you're issuing a promise a promise to pay back so there are 35 point whatever trillion promises that have to be made and they're going to be made. I think they're going to be made because, yeah, they should be made, right? And the, I don't think we necessarily, you know, and this is coming from, you know, their own statements. I, I don't think the central bank has to uh, necessarily, you know, uh, conquer or steal or, or whatever. They just print or, you know, they issue more bonds at a higher or lowest interest, a higher or lower interest rates, and they, you know, pay the interest on the existing debt. So, but I guess what I'm that system, I think, either will stop, continue, or continue less fast. So I think I think what's going to happen with the legacy system is is still very much uncertain. I think, um, but I think in the short term, it will continue to grow. It will continue to expand. Um, it's it always perplexes me when I see you know on on social media or online you know folks in South America using U.S. dollar currency. Right. So the the economic value of the U.S. dollar is 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 acceptable down there. Right. As a means of exchange, as a unit of account. Um, but it's not that nation's currency. I think I think that's kind of interesting, mostly because, you know, the question I think is, are they paying taxes to the U.S. government? Right. So the taxpayers of the U.S. government, obviously, we pay the taxes. Uh, and then, you know, that that supports the, the payments on interest, from what I understand. But, you know, it, as far as the infinite issuance of debt and the infinite issuance of cash, you know, it begs the question, like, why are we paying taxes if the, if, if the cash can just be infinitely issued, you know, and the debt is infinite as well, right? Just mathematically put it in a black box and let it do its thing. You know, put the cash and the debt, or excuse me, put the debt into a black box, stop tracking it. Just issue it, right? Just issue it and quit keep keeping track of it and queer, quit fear mongering everybody that 35 trillion is is a b, big deal because it's 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 not it's 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 infinite, right? So I guess I say that tongue in cheek and kind of sarcastically, but the point I'm trying to make is I don't think I don't think with the set with the straight face and a confident face that somebody can say that 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 this is infinite. Right. Because these things that are man made, these man made constructs, right, they have barriers. I think I think one way to to to, to justify the additional issuance of of currency like U.S. U.S. dollar currency would be to digitize it. Right. To make it digital, to operate it in such a way where it is attached to other components and elements and information in the digital domain. Uh, and I think, I think we will see that in, in our lifetimes. I think we'll see much more fluid uh, monetization of information on the internet, in social media, uh, with, you know, internet of things, with, you know, uh, electronic vehicles, with AI. I mean, when we get to that point, I think, then you have a better justification to say, the issuance of the debt is infinite. It's not attached to, you know, nation state land. It's not attached to military uh, artillery or, you know, equipment. It's not attached to productivity of oil or resources. It's attached not only to all those things, but it's also attached to the digital domain as well. So I, I, I say all that to say that 
you know, this idea that, 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 that the fiat currency is just going to magically go away. I, I think, I don't, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it'll be digitized. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a CBDC, although we probably will have CBDC, CBDC as an option. Um, but that doesn't also mean that Bitcoin will go away. Bitcoin is the ex exemplification. It is the manifestation of sound money principles, which is the 21 million cap, with it, which is the proof of work and the audit that it does on its own self every 10 minutes. Th this kind of objective, transparent, sound money principle, there is a place in the world uh, for that. In the, there is a place in the future for that in this world. Uh, and I think your generation and succeeding generations will continue to believe that um, because it's a great it's a great insurance policy too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's a great point. Yeah, um, perfect. Then uh, let's come uh, to the question that every one of my guests uh, uh, is is getting, and the question is: What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Oh man, I, you mean like hobbies? Whatever you want to go, like uh, like uh, that you can uh, oh. go f to a specific skill, uh, something you learned, uh, some hobby. Uh, like I, I leave it open to you what you want to share. It just the only rule is oh. it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. <laughs> oh yeah, well I I am a hyper scooter rider, so I I like to ride hyper scooters. Um, so what, what is a hyper a, scooter? <laughs> uh, a hyper scooter is the scooter that you stand on. Uh, it goes about 35 miles an hour or up to 45 miles an hour. Uh, you got to wear a helmet. Uh, well, you should wear a helmet. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's similar in structure as, as the scooters you see all over the place. You know, they're like, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah. They're like, uh, they have different brands like Apollo and Wolf and, uh, they're just really fun. You know, I, I, uh, I suppose it's like an e-scooter. It's like a hyper electronic scooter. Yeah, they're really fun. Uh, if you if you don't know what you're doing, you could totally kill yourself on one. They're probably more dangerous than motorcycles, uh, but I find them fascinating uh, because it's a great example of you know that that technology that we that that thesis or that that principle of technology. This idea that you know, you can have something like a lithium ion battery, you know, that has innovation built in and the battery management system. And you can, you know, literally cancel out some of the existing modes of transportation. Um, so, you know, we have some people taking hyper scooters or scooters to work now in some of the cities where it's safe. Um, you know, they're, they're good for like little short trips, like to the grocery store or something like that. Uh, you definitely have to like, it's a skill, right? So it's, it's, it's not like riding a bike at all, really. Uh, I mean, you can't really let go of the handlebars at all. Um, but I have about 2000 miles on, on my hyper scooter. I love that a lot. I, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I think my, it's fun. It's fun. My, my dad has also one at home, uh, and it's, it's really fun to drive them. I just like call them scooters. I, I didn't knew what a hyper scooter is, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really good one. They I, can, I call uh, them yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, they are called hyper scooters. Also, with, with Google, you, you can find it like that. So, uh, it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, I, but I agree, they are really, really dangerous. I, I drove with one, and it's like, wow, like you can hurt yourself really quickly, like faster than a bike, oh, yeah. faster than a motorcycle, probably also. Like not faster driving, yeah. but faster you you can hurt yourself. You can uh, hurt somebody but, else too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There you can hurt yeah. someone else too. But yeah, it's uh, the. I, I love everything that has wheels and a motor. Like, <laughs> like oh, yeah. put, put something with wheels and motors together, and I, I will love it. I was coming up up on a farm, uh, and there we have tractors and all those those things, and I, I loved it. Too. I loved it a lot, like it, just driving around and doing things on, on, on the farm. Uh, that That's kind of, uh, maybe I, I will go my, my Bitcoin retirement uh, on a farm and, and just drive around with, with different vehicles, not doing anything yeah. productive, just like messing around on the farm. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. They're, they're just loads of fun. I mean... I mean, you do got to watch out for the, uh, the people though, you know, you gotta, you gotta be courtesy, you know, be courteous, be civilized, think about other people before you think about yourself. You know, I think that that's a good way to live, but yeah, you know, the hyper scooter, the scooters, the e-scooters rather, um, 
I got my first one, like, I think it was like three or four years ago. I was like, man, I'm going to kill myself on this thing. Cause I'm not a motorcycle guy. So I was a little scared. Uh, but you know, I had the helmet and everything and I had pads and everything. And my buddy was like, dude, it's not that serious. And I'm like, yes, it is. It's that serious. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I have fallen a couple times, but I'm still here. So uh, apparently, you know, I guess God wants you to be here to talk about Bitcoin. I don't know. Who knows? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> really cool. Um, we have an end in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, actually is. And your question is an interesting one. Uh, how can we ensure that the ideology you have as a Bitcoiner today would be understood by your ancestors uh, 200 years uh, from now? Yeah. So this kind of goes into uh, my work as a, as a, a, well, my role as an attorney. So I've been sending emails out to different uh, law firms uh, here in the United States. I've, I've, I've gotten some responses back, but the long story short is I want to put the Bitcoin into a living trust, um, a legal trust. So it's called a, um, I think it's called a residual charitable trust. So the idea is that I would move my current Bitcoin into the residual, excuse me, residual charitable trust. Okay. There would be a trustee, probably like one of the third parties out here that are, that are creditable. And they would over time use the Bitcoin for the benefit of beneficiaries, myself, my mom, some of my nephews. But the idea there is that if anything were to happen to me and I were to die, for example, that trust will still be alive. Right. And the beneficiaries, mom, nephews and things like that, aunts, they could still benefit from the Bitcoin from the trust. So this idea is that I'm passing along the property and the principles and the ideology to kind of go and answer your question. I would do uh, first. I talk about Bitcoin all the time to my family. They're so done. They're they're like they're done. And my friends, they're done. So I'm just like, look, if you want to stay poor, that's fine. As for me, you know, we're going to the moon, baby. So, but legally, one way I want to do that is put the Bitcoin into a charitable residual trust. When the Bitcoin is all run out, then by law, the trust has to give a certain portion of the property to a charity. Yeah. So that's kind of how I want to move the Bitcoin into the future beyond when, I, when I'm already dead, right? Which I don't know how long I'm going to live. Who knows, right? Um, you, yeah. you have a scooter. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a scooter, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Uh, it's an interesting way. Uh, really, really cool. Perfect. And yeah, thank you so much, Vic, for being on the show. Uh, before I let you cool, go, thanks. where can people find you, ask you questions, DM you? So yeah, I have a uh, YouTube. Uh, it's Vic Mark uh, Jagrock. Uh, it's uh, at V-I-C-M-A-R-C 4984. Uh, and then you can just email me VLM for life, L I F E at gmail.com. Um, so the, my social media presence right now is, is pretty lacking, but I'm creating these Bitcoin in 30 minute videos and hopefully get one up here pretty soon. Uh, and then you have, you know, my writings as well. Really cool. Thank you so much for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. Thanks for, for joining us you. today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.